A fuselage era Chrysler coming up next. Hi, this is Adam. Welcome to my Rare Classic Car Channel. Today, another fuselage era Mopar vehicle for the Chrysler fans. This 1972 New Yorker. This is a really rare car these days. They didn't sell well new, even though I absolutely love the way this fuselage styling looked. It's hard to think of a bad car from this era of Chrysler design, just from an aesthetic standpoint. They're so long and trim looking in spite of the fact that these cars are huge. But in any case, the fuselage era of design came into Chrysler in the 1969 model year. After a number of years of what I would call very conventionally styled cars in the mid 60s. And that was arguably in response to Elwood Engel being hired to replace Virgil Exner. Virgil Exner had uh, been fired from Chrysler in the early 60s as a result of the relatively poor sales, in particular of the early 60s models that were introduced by Chrysler. The, whether it's the 61 Imperial with the freestanding pod headlights or the early 60s Furies and Polaras, Darts, Valiants that all just had a kind of funky look to them. By the way, if you look at a picture of a 60 to Plymouth and then you find old design photos, that vehicle was actually going to be very asymmetrical to the point that it had a split uh, in the front of the vehicle that was off center and also had three taillights on one side and one on the other. <laughs> so look up a 62 Plymouth and the design that you see that made it to production was actually less radical than what the original design proposal was. In any event, Chrysler let Exner go in the early 60s and hired Elwin Engel from Ford, where he participated in a number of famous designs, most, arguably most importantly, the 61 Continental, which he oversaw to some degree, but I believe was really a car that was done by a gentleman named Wes Dahlberg. And that was a seminal car, still is today, something that's really tough to replicate. But you can almost see themes of that vehicle the 61 Continental in this vehicle, just how clean the side is, albeit it has more tumble home and curvature than the Continental did, which was very upright. But this is just a super clean, long, wide, and frankly tall car. It's two inches taller than a contemporary GM or Ford vehicle of the era. So it just gives it this feeling of somehow being svelte with this very sleek, nicely radiused body curvature, and yet it's a tall car when you walk up to it. Um, it just feels bigger than a contemporary GM or Ford car of the year, mostly because those, again, they were almost two inches lower in overall height and even the cowl height. So this cowl here comes up to above your waistline, which is pretty rare for a vehicle of this era. But the fuselage era Chrysler, again, started in 1969 and continued till about 73, although one could argue the 73 redesigns, some of them with the new bumper standard in the front, kind of ruined some of the fuselage era look, in particular for the New Yorker, which got this really boxy front end and did away with, I think, this, this rather cool looking grille that they had in 72. 71 also had a really neat, slightly different grille and this loop bumper that went around here. And the fuselage era, and that term for design just refers to these sleek body sides that have the curvature of an aircraft fuselage. And there's some really neat design features about them, like the bumpers that extend all the way up. The 69 Imperial is even more extreme with the bumper going all the way up, allegedly to help protect, you know, the car from rear end accidents, etc. Although this is not a reinforced bumper, nor is the front loop style reinforced, hence the redesign that came in 73 when the five mile an hour frontal impact standard came into being. And then by 74, it was a five mile an hour rear bumper standard. So the bumpers got pretty big over that time period. So this New Yorker slotted in above the Newport, 
below the New Yorker Brome and the Imperial. And as I said at the beginning, this car really did not sell well. In sedan format, it sold less than 10,000 units. Uh, and it didn't matter if it were a coupe or a hardtop or this, the hardtop was actually the best selling. And this four door post sedan sold, I believe seven or 8,000. The hardtop sold somewhere between 10 and 12,000 units per year, which was really, you know, not great. And I hypothesize that part of the reason for this is that Chrysler priced this New Yorker, not the New Yorker Brome, the standard New Yorker, right on top of the Oldsmobile 88, sorry, Oldsmobile 98 luxury sedan. So the upper level 98 trim, as well as the uh, Buick Electra Limited. So this car was about $4,900 new which was actually a little more than that, 4950-ish, almost $5,000 in base price, which was not at all a cheap car for 1972. That was a pretty expensive car. And, you know, putting this up against a top of the line Olds 98 or Buick Electra Limited, that's pretty tough, especially given this wasn't a New Yorker Brome. New Yorker Brome stickered for a couple hundred dollars more and that would have put the base price above even the top Buick Electra or the Olds 98. I think that's one reason why these didn't sell well. And one could argue that it was priced right on top of the Mercury Marquis. Uh, and really the Chrysler followed the Ford Mercury pricing. So the New Yorker Brome was about the same price as the Marquis Brome. And this New York was about the same price as the Marquis. The problem is the, the Ford, uh, the Mercury's didn't sell well either. So I think their pricing strategy was arguably a bit flawed and certainly didn't, didn't help Chrysler. But Chrysler really, at this point, had never quite recovered from the early 60s when they introduced very radical Exner designs and made some product planning errors and downsizing cars like the Fury to a smaller body, an intermediate body which they did arguably in response to, they, they heard a rumor that GM was going to downsize their vehicles significantly and they wanted to beat them to it. And GM did not do that. GM took some weight out of their vehicles when they were reintroduced for 61 and shortened them slightly, but didn't take them down a whole platform size. So Chrysler was caught off guard. And if you look as an example, take a look at a 62 Dodge 880 and look at the back end of that vehicle. You'll notice it's the same as the Chrysler from the era. So Chrysler hastily cobbled together a Dodge, a full-size Dodge that they called the 880 when they realized that they had made a planning blunder. And to be honest, Chrysler never really recovered from that era. They, for the next several decades, went through a series of ups and downs and ups and downs, uh, everything from after the fuselage era, the next generation of cars that were introduced, uh, first of all, they kept some of the fuselage era designs, even though they refreshed them. They kept this big car around like the uh, New Yorker and the New Yorker Brome until 78 was the last year. And then they came out with the R-body Chryslers, which were pretty big for the era and uh, had rather lackluster quality, let's say, which did not sell well. And, push Chrysler further to the brink until Lee Iacocca famously testified before Congress, got them a bailout, and they found some religion with the K car, and in particular, the minivan, which was a brainchild of Hal Spurlick, whom Iacocca recruited from Ford. Both Iacocca and Hal Spurlick were Ford firees. So Chrysler, during their most successful time period, I shouldn't say most successful, but very successful time period of some of the 80s and into the 90s, uh, had a number of Ford firees or people who left Ford just two steps ahead of the sheriff, including Bob Lutz, who came from Ford as well. So Lee Iacocca, Bob Lutz, Hal Spurlick, all ex-Ford people who kind of put Chrysler back on the map and the car company to watch in the 90s. Yet I digress a little bit. So back to this fuselage era car. As I mentioned, this was priced right on top of the Olds 98 LS, the top trim line, not the Regency admittedly, 
but uh, in the Buick Electra Limited. So tough competition for this vehicle to face, and it just consequently did not sell well. And most of the full-size Chryslers, the C-bodies in this era, did not sell well. And I think some of it was pricing, and some of it was the features that you got, and, you know, a few other things. I will say that there are a number of things that Chrysler did very well, and I'll step back here so you can see it. One thing that they tended to do well in this era was packaging. And you notice the rear door is significantly longer than the front door here. And that allows for very, very wide entry. And the door also opens to almost a 90 degree angle. So great entry into the passenger compartment here. This front seat is all the way back and I have a ton of leg room. I'm six feet one and I could sit back here with no issue. There's also a lot of headroom in this car because of the fuselage era styling that's rather tall. But one could argue, you know, compared to a 98 LS, I don't know that the materials in this are, you know, as nice. These door panels are pretty chintzy. I think it's funny, you know, the back door panel doesn't have the New Yorker emblem, which you see on the front, which was added in 72. It wasn't there in 71. So I guess they thought the door panel looked kind of cheap and threw that on there to gussy it up. Falls, fails, throw a few wreaths and crests on the car, make the buyer feel like they got something luxurious. And in the front seat, oh, Chrysler always had a great morning buzzer. Lots of room in the front seat here. And you can see passenger side is not a bad place to be. This dashboard though, eh, you know, I don't know. It's, it, how do I feel about it? It's almost the same as the Imperial. The Imperial though does have a full complement of gauges. If you watch my video on that, you'll notice that uh, it had, the Imperial had a temperature gauge as well as the voltmeter plus an oil pressure gauge. This just has the voltmeter or the alternator uh, indicator there. No temperature. It does have, you know, the idiot lights and it has a cold light, which the motor's not cold right now, so it won't illuminate. But this dashboard is eh, kind of somewhat cheap looking. That's my GPS right there too. This is soft plastic. This is all hard down here. And this is metal, like a metal grain door, which is pretty sweet. I have not seen that on other makes. I will say that the speedometer is very legible. It feels huge if you're not used to it. And all the controls are, you know, rather large, accessible, I would say. Uh, it doesn't take an excessive reach. This does have an aftermarket radio, a cassette radio that somebody put in years ago. It came stock with an AM radio. Thankfully, the person I bought it from didn't cut the dash, and I have the original radio. I just don't mind having FM, <laughs> so I haven't replaced it. And it does have manual air conditioning. You could get in these, the auto temp system, which my Imperial has. You could also get dual air conditioners. So this car does have the single air conditioner up front. But you could get a dual air conditioner that had outlets in the back there. That's just the rear defogger outlet in the middle. Um, if you really wanted to hang meat in the car, you were in a warm climate. And that was something unique that, that Chrysler offered in this era. They had a number of, of neat features that they had. It's funny, if you watch the dealer training video compared to the Ford uh, or the GM, they kind of complain that the glove box for the GM cars is hard to reach because it's generally down here and they're touting that theirs is up here. Uh, at the same time, you notice there's no air vents for the air conditioning over here. The only two upper register vents are those two right there. There's nothing on the driver's side. The only other air vents you have are those right there for the air conditioning and down here. There are a couple little swing doors that you can open in the HVAC system at the bottom if you want to let a little cool air in at the floor level. But I just find it humorous that they, in the one sales video, they tout the fact that this glove box location makes it easily accessible for the driver and the passenger. 
but it created the deletion of these vents so they could have this big glove box that was easily accessible. And then in the next year's video, when they redid the dash for 74, they tout the fact that the dashboard has more vents than anybody else. Uh, and I can't remember if, I think there's six vents on those. There's two in the middle. There's maybe there's even more. Um, and they moved the glove box down to the middle on the next generation of uh, dashboard. So other, you know, chrysler -y things, I would say, that are different from others. This steering wheel is small in diameter, which they all were small, but this one is slightly smaller and it sits closer to the driver. You're almost in kind of, it sounds funny to say, but a racing style position in a Chrysler with this small wheel that's quite close to the driver. The GM and Fords, I would say, had more of what I'll call the vice president feel to them where it's more arms out. Here, even with the seat all the way back, this wheel's relatively close to me, even though the pedals are you know, a decent distance. You also have the vent poles, even though this is an air-conditioned car, where you can uh, you can open the vent, the kickwell vents on either side. There's a pole for each side, which was starting to be rare for air-conditioned cars. Chrysler kept that. Even my Imperial has it. Chrysler kept a lot of, I'll call it old-school features, longer than others, including vent windows that you could still get even in 1978 on some of the New Yorkers, which were long gone from other makes by then. So they did keep some of the, like I called it, old-fashioned things, like enough room to have a hat on, lots of headroom in this car. Nice headliner. Only one dome light, though. Whereas the Mercury's and the Ford's also had lights in the C-pillars. And I don't believe that there's a kickwell light on either side either. No, there's not. So they saved a little money there. Loop pile carpeting as opposed to uh, the cut pile, you know, shag. There's also not as much sound deadening in this car as you would find in a GM or Ford of the era. It's, there's more wind noise, I would say tire noise, some of which can be attributable to the fact that this is a unibody car as opposed to a full frame vehicle. Although I will say, in spite of being unibody, this has very, very beefy subframes underneath it in the front and the rear. And it's also a stiff ride. So we'll go for a ride in a bit, but this is not a cushy riding car. It's actually pretty firm for the air. I would say it's, it'd be the equivalent of if you got the heavy duty suspension in GM or Ford in the standard car with the torsion bars up front and the leaf spring rear suspension. So, this car did come with aftermarket floor mats that appear to be very period, and I have not touched them. I think they're pretty sweet. Where else are you going to find floor mats like that? Let's take a look at the trunk. This car does have vacuum-operated trunk release. You push the button there, and the trunk opens. So let's take a look. doors do close nicely with minimal effort and I have jumper cables in here not because uh, of anything that's necessary for this car uh, I'm gonna go pump air up in tires in a number of my other cars and the connector on this air compressor broke so I have to use jumper cables it's too cheap to buy a new compressor because that one works just fine but you can see still the original spare tire in here original trunk mat and carpeting very big trunk, 21 cubic feet. So it can hold a lot. Here's the vacuum activated mechanism that opens the trunk when you push the button inside. It does have kind of a tinny sound when you close the trunk though, which all the Chrysler's of the era have, more so than GM and Ford's. And the other funny thing about the Chrysler's is Everything's a bit opposite. The odometers turn the opposite way from the GM odometers. On this, the trunk emblem, if you were going to open this trunk as a GM car, you'd swing it counterclockwise. Chrysler, you swing it clockwise. So GM would have had this hinged the other way. 
And Chrysler's, you put the key in, if you're a GM fan, upside down. So the keys always go in like this, which according to a friend who's a Chrysler engineer from the era, they did because it, it allegedly helped in winter time for the lock cylinders not to freeze. I will trust him on that. He is a diehard Chrysler fan, worked at Chrysler during the era. But just look at how long and big this car is. Pretty impressive. Let's pop the hood and take a look underneath there. This is powered by a 440 and I think you know, one could some people complain about the Chrysler ride. It's not, to be honest, my favorite for a full size car just because it's so firm. But you can't complain much about the 440 engine and the 727 transmission. I mean, these are just great, great motors. Although, unfortunately, Chrysler surrounded them with some lack, less than stellar components, in particular, carburetors. This has a stock holly 4160 carburetor that's what came on it and they're notorious leakers and have trouble with the diaphragms on them i actually just rebuilt this one in the last day and i also gave it a full tune-up cap wire plugs rotors and everything and this is not a fun tune-up job for old car by old car standards and I can only imagine, I had a number of mechanics tell me that, you know, people would come in back in the day with these cars and the mechanics would sear their hands on the manifolds because the plugs are under the manifolds. It's a blind job from the top. There's stuff in the way, unless you remove the wheel and this, this uh, splash shield here, in which case it's easier to get to some of these, but there's still just stuff generally in the way. And particularly on the driver's side where you've got power steering gear, dipstick, and the exhaust. So other vehicles, much easier to do tune-ups on relative to these. I would say by, you know, modern standards, this isn't hard. But by the standards of the era, not fun. I can do a tune-up on a GM car or a Ford in an hour of this era. This one took me more than twice as long. Nonetheless, uh, great, great engines and transmissions. Very, very durable. Another thing that Chrysler, you know, again, the basic core components are excellent. The 440 is an excellent motor. The 727 is excellent. The carburation they use, whether it's the Thermoquad or the Holley 4160, yeah, you know, I would say compared to a Quadrajet, not great. You know, maybe compares favorably to a Ford Motorcraft 4300, which also is not a great carburetor. But I would say these are rather troublesome. And the other piece for the Mopar fans, some of you are gonna get upset at me for pointing this out, that lovely component right there, the ballast resistor. Those love to go out and thankfully they're easy to replace. Keep a spare one in your glove box. It's just held on by the one fastener there and has a few clips going to it but they love to go out in wet weather. And what happens then is the car, it'll start up, but it instantly stalls. So if you have that symptom on your Chrysler that it starts right up and then stalls out instantly, that's your culprit. So these did have electronic ignition. This car, you can see, it's got the electronic ignition box there on the firewall. So there's no points in condenser, which is great, but that ballast resistor uh, and sometimes the pickup coils and these distributors, you know, aren't great. So I don't know that Chrysler got much credit for the system being more reliable than even a points-based setup. So that's a bit of the tough thing about these cars that it's a, uh, it's arguably an advancement, the electronic ignition and it, you know, you don't have any points to adjust, but some of the components, particularly that ballast resistor, aren't great. And as I said, you know, core motor and everything is excellent on these, but some of the components that Chrysler used, you know, just weren't, weren't the best. These cars were sadly demo derbied a lot. And one reason why 
look at the gap between the grill and the radiator. And if you crawled underneath, you'd also see, you can see here, there's pretty beefy reinforcements for crashes. You can also see one of the rubber isolating mounting points there. But they are tough cars. If you had a, a Chrysler station wagon, it could pull 7,000 pounds, 7,000 pounds. Of course, had to be equipped with the trailer tow package and the external transmission cooler and things like that. But from the factory, you could get a station wagon that towed 7,000 pounds. Now it might be, he might elongate the wheelbase after you towed something that heavy with it. Um, but to me, amazing that a unibody car could pull something like that. And a wagon from Ford to GM, the top that they could pull was about 5,000 pounds, maybe slightly over that. So amazingly beefy cars, really pleasing to the eye to look at. This came stock from the factory with this olive greenish paint and the painted black top. It's not a vinyl roof, which I think makes it look quite sharp. And I do love the center reverse lights and the tail lights down here. It's kind of funky. Overall, just a cool old car and fiber optic turn signal indicators. Let's take it for a drive. All right, let's go for a ride. One feature I forgot to mention here is the map light that you can turn on. But here we go. And for all the Mopar fans, the noise that you love to hear. Ready? Boy, does this thing run great. I just put new plugs, wires, distributor cap, rotor, rebuilt the carb. Perfectly smooth. See my hands not even trembling at all, putting it on the wheel. All right, let's go. I'll wait for this car to pass me first and I'll go. This gear shift, by the way, Mopar used for a long time. My 83 Grand Fury still has that. First impression as you set off is this seat is very pogo sticky. You kind of bounce up and down. Chrysler seats were like this for a long time. My friend's got a 62 Plymouth and it has the same feel. I don't think the seat engineers talked to the suspension engineers because you kind of pogo stick up and down, whether this car, my Imperial, or something else. You can see the turn signal indicator there, by the way. Pretty stiff ride. But again, these Chryslers were focused more on handling than ride. That was just their philosophy. So if you want a cushy ride, you get a Ford. If you want a good handling and a relatively firm ride, get a Chrysler. If you want something in between, get a GM. That's the best way I can describe it. And I wouldn't call it noisy in here, but it definitely has more tire noise and wind noise than a Ford or GM of the era, which given the price point that I described for the car, probably didn't bode well if a buyer took a test drive in one of these. And, you know, if I were taking a test drive in this versus a Mercury Marquis Brome or a Olds 98, I would have walked away thinking that, you know, the Olds and the Ford rode better um, probably in quieter inside, and I probably would have bought them. And that's my personal preference. Again, I think that Mopar has a lot of great things on balance. You know, the 440 and the torque flight transmission just really can't be beat. And if handling was your thing, then you'd buy this. I mean, it has no problem getting up and going. You can hear the motor really wasn't revving even that much. It's a fun car. You know, the other impression here is that Imperial was obviously a more expensive car, but this New Yorker was not a cheap vehicle, and the Imperial just comes across as being so much more refined. It's so much more quiet. It's uh, less crude, less wind noise, and 
you know, this New Yorker, I don't know that I would say it's more refined in terms of wind rush and road noise than a Caprice. I actually would say the Caprice is probably even a little bit more refined. So I think that probably hurt Chrysler a little bit. But on the plus side, really good visibility, whether it's through the front or through the side. Great headroom, great packaging relative to the era. GM really just didn't have a lot of great packaging, I would say, nor did Ford, especially in the rear seat. This car has way more room and it's wider. It just feels so much wider even than the GMs and the Fords of the era. So I think I give Chrysler kudos for their packaging, which I think was better. And I would say their engines and transmissions, as I mentioned, were just excellent. And the handling was far better than anything for GM. One downside to the handling is, they are a little fun. The one downside to the handling is that the rear leaf spring suspension, if you have to panic stop, they tended to have a lot of axle hop and it was tough to panic stop in a straight line with the rear leaf setup that these have. If you watch any Bud Lindemann car and track videos from the 70s of these Chryslers and he's, he's panic stopping them, you watch the rear end just walk all over the place because of that. So that I would say is one downside. Brake pedal feel isn't bad. There's good initial bite. I would say relatively firm pedal. Good balance of firmness and pedal feel versus uh, assist. I would say yeah, GM had a similarly good feel. Ford didn't have quite the same brake bite, if you will, and a little bit over boosted in the steering and the brakes. All of these cars are over boosted relative to today. But the steering in this Chrysler, actually, it's, it's not a one-finger car. I mean, it is when you're driving like this. You know, I can use one finger and steer. But if I'm doing parallel parking, this is not a one-finger car. It actually requires some steering input. And it's got a little get-up-and-go, too. So... It's a lot of weight to move around in this car, but no lack of power when you're driving around town or on the freeway. I actually, there was one time where I was driving this car and I was in a lane on a freeway entrance ramp that was ending. And somebody in the lane next to me was driving a contemporary Ford pickup. And he and I both floored it at about the same time. His lane was ending and he thought he could get ahead of me. And he couldn't. He couldn't pass me. In fact, once we hit, I think, 99 or 100 miles an hour, his fuel cut off, <laughs> it cut in, and he just dropped way back because uh, the motor basically wouldn't let him go any, or the governor wouldn't let him go any faster. And I think he wasn't overly happy about that. I just kept going. I mean, this car will keep pulling and pulling. I would say top speed's probably 125, 120, something in that zip code. But you know, even at 100 miles an hour, I had plenty of plenty of pedal travel left so one thing the Chrysler also did really nicely and it's hard to see because it's still daytime but they have floodlights for their gauges and it illuminates really nicely at night so I have to do a night video of this car you can see though the camera's bobbing up and down more as I go over this frost teeth pavement again as a function of that torsion bar leaf spring suspension which is rather stiff for the period combined with the bouncy seat springs my imperial is the same way you know you kind of pogo stick around a little bit but you know these c-body chryslers are tough tough cars they are unibody they don't have the full body on frame but they are extremely tough cars. They did unfortunately rust relatively quickly. And I think that coupled with the slow sales of these cars just means that there's not many around, unfortunately. I, I've i only seen, you know, since I bought this car about, oh, nine years ago, I think I've seen maybe one other or two other good condition C bodies for sale. Uh, not you know you you find ones that aren't in great shape, 
but this car's only got 33,000 miles on it. I think it had about 29,000 when I bought it. So I've driven it, enjoyed it. And I toy around with selling it sometimes because I've got a 12,000 mile 71 New Yorker and the 12,000 mile Imperial. So it's kind of redundant, but I've done a lot of work to this car over the years. I cut my teeth on learning about Chrysler's on it. So I'm a bit attached to it. I put, as I just mentioned, I did a full tune-up on it. I put a water pump on it. Um, new front end components. Had an alignment done. And it runs just spectacularly well. This 440 is very, very smooth. And it's just a joy to end up driving around. So I hope you enjoyed this video of the 72 New Yorker here. I'll put the left blinker on so you can see the fiber optic indicator a bit better. And unlike the Imperial, this actually does have turn signal indicators in the dash. Why the Imperial does not, it only has the fiber optics, I don't know. But that's the way it is. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. A few closing thoughts here um, I thought I'd share. Chrysler always made a, a big deal in the sales training videos of how the buckle on their vehicles was different than Ford and that the Fords, you know, basically the buckle, if you uh, were exiting, it could catch on a lady's dress. Here, clearly the buckle is below the seat, so that's not a risk, but the problem is it rattles against the seat frame unless you buckle it, which most people didn't do back then. So that was probably an annoyance. And then the other thing that I would say that's interesting here is you can hear a little relay kick on as I move this here, here kick. So if you, even in the heat position, if you had moved the uh, temperature slider past that relay point, the air conditioning compressor would engage to try to ensure that the windows didn't defog up. So, or sorry, didn't fog up. So you can hear the little relay click on right there. So I thought that was another interesting, different feature from other makes and models. And here are my all my old tune-up components. The car actually ran pretty well, aside from the crud that was in the carburetor. But these are the original wires that came. They were orange. Some people ragged on me and said, orange wires, get rid of those. These are original wires for Chrysler Electronic Ignition. You can see they say Chrysler Corporation on them. Electronic, they're date coded March of 1971, but they were just getting too old and not clamping well anymore. I mean, heck, after 50 years, I think they're allowed to, to start letting go. And these spark plugs are still working well, but probably 30 years old. So, and the Holly 4160 carburetor I put a rebuilt one on it and then I will I usually have a spare of each carburetor so I will take this one and rebuild it so it's ready for the next time